So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today's April Fool's Day, April the 1st. So you would think if Mother Nature were playing a prank on me right now or the rest of us, it would be snowy outside. And as you saw from the opening, that's exactly what's going on. This is episode number 153 of Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers. It is 30 degrees Fahrenheit outside, which is minus one in Celsius. This is the way to be. So thank you for being here. If you're brand new, uh, what we're doing today is addressing topics that were submitted by viewers through the last week. And you can find out what we're going to talk about by looking in the video description down below. And you'll also find lots of helpful links down there as well. So good stuff. I think we're going to jump right into it. So here's the first question from Daryl Hamner. Last fall, I decided to leave more honey for the bees and hopefully not have to feed syrup. So I not only left two deeps untouched, but also a number of frames in supers were left for the bees. They have one and I have 12 hives. Still have plenty of honey in the deeps and in the supers. I decided to remove the supers and extract the honey. So there would be drawn comb available for spring nectar flow. I have a problem. The honey in the supers is mostly granulated and can't be extracted. Are the frames of granulated honey lost to me, or is there some way I can get the honey out? I've considered uncapping and returning the frames to the hives, hoping the bees will take the now more accessible honey, or even leaving the honey available for robbing away from my hives. Of course, any suggestions? So for those of you who don't know, this is one of the risks of leaving honey in your honeycomb. Uh, once it's capped even, it can granulate or solidify or become what's referred to as set. So what happens then is it doesn't spin out. And some people might think, oh, we can just put it in a warmer and get it up to a temperature warm enough to reliquify that honey, which can happen at about 110 degrees Fahrenheit. And then just keep it below the threshold where the wax itself would melt. I highly recommend not trying that. It makes the wax soft and you can end up with a big mess and lose it all. So, but what can you do? It's actually listed right here. If it's a flow super, if it's some kind of plastic frame or whatever, you can use hot water and rinse it right out. But then of course you've lost all those valuable carbohydrates. And you might think, yeah, I'll just leave it on the hive and then the bees will use it. But here's what happens, it doesn't, they don't use it. That's because when new nectar is coming in and they're putting new nectar in the cells, they use their newest resources first and then they go to the stored old stuff, especially if it's solidified, crystallized, or set. So it's just going to be there. So I recommend, now this is where it gets down to, what would you personally do? I would personally, you can uh, set it aside for new swarms, new package installs, and things like that. But then that violates the policy of making sure that we're not sharing potential diseases with other colonies and things like that. But this is a healthy colony. They're good to go. There are no known problems really with this colony. So you can save it, freeze it to hold it where it's at, and then put it out, warm it up in a new colony, new package install, something like that. Or this is what I personally would do. Uh, we get these warm days now and you can set up a feeding station out away from your colony. I recommend that you do that 50 to 100 yards away. And then you can have something uh, like a rack that will set them out. Sometimes I just put a standard box. If these are medium frames, then I use a medium box. If they're deep frames, I use a deep box. Leave the bottom open. And then I just put a telescoping cover over the top of it. And that's to protect it from heavy dew, rain, things like that. So the bottom's wide open. That leaves it open to robbing by other bees. We're really not in the wasp time of year yet. So it's all bees for now, at least where I am in Pennsylvania. So you know then that when the temperatures rise 50 degrees Fahrenheit or more, that's when you want it to be out there. I wouldn't leave it overnight because raccoons and other things can be attracted to it. 
but they will clean it out pretty quick. So it's just like a robbing scenario, but it's in the open. And by leaving it open on the bottom, they have open access to it. And uh, all the bits and pieces fall out on the ground. If you want to collect that, you put a tray down there. And uh, they'll clean it up. Then you put it in storage or you put it right back on the hive when the time is right for expansion. So that's what I personally would do. And uh, I've made videos about it. Time lapse sequences and everything else. And uh, the bees line up side by side and work their way across the comb. And they clean everything out. And then the edges of the bees wax, which is what you're trying to save, is just in little rough edges like they were in a hurry. And that's a quick cleanup. Puts it right back in service. Now, if you want to, after that's done, after they're clean from the robbers, put it in your freezer for a freeze cycle just to make sure there's no eggs in there from wax worms and things like that. But the wax moths aren't flying yet either because look what's going on outside. But maybe where you are, they are. So that's one way to go. And that is question number one. We're moving on to question number two. This comes from G's Bees. Fred, I'm receiving two packages of Saskatraz bees tomorrow from Man Lake. The members of my local bee club told me to install the packages of bees just before sunset so they don't abscond immediately. They explained that you want to install in the evening so they stay in the hive overnight. Would it be a bad idea to install around noon? I work afternoons and evenings and won't be around during the time suggested by my club. The weather's expected to be 55 to 60 degrees and partly cloudy. Okay, generally, I don't like to settle like arguments or disagreements, but this looks, this sounds more like a debate. So if we're debating, we'll all put our two cents worth in. So when you get a package, especially on a day when it's in the mid 50s to 60s, and if it's sunny, that's a good time to put it in. I would not wait. I'd put the package right in there, and I don't think they're going to abscond, and I'll explain why. When you get your package, where's your queen? Queen's in a cage, just like this. Then you're gonna pull, right here is the candy side of your cage, so there's a cork on this end. You're gonna pull that out. And then this can be angled slightly up, but this goes between the frames so the bees can feed and attend to the queen right there. But install your package right away. Don't wait until nightfall, there's no reason to do it. Why? And why would they not abscond? Why would they not just take off? Well, because where's the queen? She's in here. She can't fly with them. She's not going anywhere. And they're grounded by the queen and her pheromone, even though they knew they got acquainted in transit. The reason that bees abscond, first of all, the place that you put them in is uninviting, unsuited to them. So make sure it is suited to them. Have the right size, eight or 10 frame deep and nothing bigger. And then you put your insulated or your inner cover, whichever it is for me, Going forward, I'm going to use insulated inner covers on all of my Langstraw style hives from now on. So you put that on there and then you put feed on there, sugar syrup, one to one, eight pounds of dry granulated sugar mixed with one gallon of water. And you put that on there because that gives them a resource if a storm's coming or something like that. So they have everything they need to keep them right there, including the queen, which is the future of the colony. So I say put them in right away. Don't wait till nighttime. I see no reason to do that. And not only that, they'll start doing orientation flights right away. You have a great temperature day, 55 to 60. They're going to be flying around and they're going to be getting to know the area. And that means that they're going to get active and get resources quicker than if you keep them in overnight. So I don't think they're going to abscond. And if they do, let us know. But I think that is no problem at all. Install the package, release the bees right away, keep the queen in her cage, and uh, pull the corks. And that takes about uh, one to three days for them to eat through that sugar candy in general. And in the meantime, they're feeding the queen, taking care of her, and spreading her pheromone through those bees. And they don't know the terrain, so there's, no, there's nothing really to encourage them, unless you're putting in some kind of hive that's in such bad shape uh, that they just don't feel comfortable being there. And question number three, Charles Tanner. Fred, do you know anything about on-the-spot queen rearing? It sounds like a good way for backyard beekeepers to start resource hives. Again, this came up. Uh, master beekeepers talk about this. And uh, my, this is, again, personal preference, right? So first of all, what is on-the-spot queen rearing? Well, you don't have a queen in your colony. Or you're going to remove the queen. You're going to make a split. You're going to decide where they're going to make the new queen and build up the new queen cells. And uh, I don't personally like the method, but I'm going to explain what it is. So you're going to find cells that have eggs in them or freshly hatched larvae. And uh, you're going to take your hive tool. 
which I thought I had handy, but I don't. Take a hive tool and like here's the here's the cells. You're going to take the bottom of the cell and you're going to rake it down. And some people do several cells. And the point is they've damaged the adjacent beeswax to the cell that's got the larvae. Who picked? Who picked the egg? Who picked the larva? You did, the beekeeper. How do you know which one of those eggs is the best and would be preferred by the bees? Because in the absence of a queen and her pheromone, they're going to pick among the open larvae, which is going to be the eggs preferred, in my opinion. I know some people say it has to be a hatched larva. So whatever you decide, I'm just going to explain the process. They disrupt the cells around the cell that you've chosen. And then they're supposed to draw that out and make a queen with that to replace the one that's missing. And the one should be missing for 48 hours before you do that. Some people say 72. Anything that causes them to be alarmed that the queen's pheromone is absent. But see, if you go to 72, now we're at the point where any eggs that were in there when you removed your queen, they're at the hatching stage. So, I don't do it, and here's what may happen if you do do it. They can go ahead and start drawing out cells, but guess what? Oftentimes, they'll draw the queen cell off a cell that you did not select for your on-the-spot queen rearing. So that showed you that they rejected what you decided to do. So the other thing is then you've got damaged cells adjacent to it, so sometimes that's smashing other eggs, smashing other larvae, and so on, and you disrupt the comb, and sometimes they don't restore the comb exactly the way it was to usable cells again. So that's another reason I don't do it, but I do what's referred to as walk away splits. So I find a frame that's got eggs and in uh, larvae of all stages of development, and that's my frame that I let the bees make their new queen from. And it's always worked for me. I've not had one colony of bees do that. And what should you be putting them in to do that? I recommend you get one of those five frame nucleus hives, deeps, and you put them in there. And that's what you use. And if you had, as we mentioned earlier, maybe a frame of that uh, solidified honey or something like that as a reinforcement, you put that in the easternmost spot so that it warms earliest in the morning and the bees might use that when it's nice and warm. But uh, I don't do on the spot queen rearing. I do the walkway splits and the bees have always found the eggs that they wanted, the larvae they wanted to develop, and uh, they did their own queen cells. So that's my opinion. You don't have to mess up the frames or swish frames or anything else or cells. Uh, the bees will do a better job than we will of picking out which is the most promising next queen in that colony. Question number four comes from Keith Spillman. Half tracks and honeybees. A couple of questions. Do queens do orientation flights? And uh, once you have a swarm in the box, can you immediately relocate them without any worry about the three feet or three mile rule? So I'll answer the first one. I've seen queens do orientation flights on the day that they depart. And sometimes the bees will have fire drills and uh, we refer to that as, uh, that's when the bees are making preparations for swarming. And instead of the orientation flights, which are figure eights in front of the hive that go higher, or they do ellipses as they go higher and take off in another direction. But usually when they're sticking around and just orientating, they are doing figure eights. When they start doing the cyclone, they're about to head out. But sometimes they all just come out in front of the hive and they hover there. And that's because they're waiting for the queen to come out. And this can happen a day before she makes her actual flight because the queen might actually be doing some test flights herself, but she doesn't do orientation flights in the way that you think she would. Like the queen, at least I haven't seen it. And I spent a lot of time watching landing wards when I know a colony is about to swarm because it's an area of study. So when the queen comes out and if she does a flight, it's very brief and she goes right back to the landing board. So she's not doing the figure eights. The queen's not hovering in the air. Can you imagine the jeopardy the queen would be in if she's just hanging out for fun when she's heavy, by the way. So, um, she does a couple fakes, like sometimes they'll come out, re-land, and even sometimes go back inside. And that's why on the day that they're going to actually swarm, you'll often see the workers that are going to go in the swarm with her. They'll come out, hover around, get impatient, and either land or collect on the front of the hive, or they keep going in and out. They go in to make sure the queen is still there. Then they come back out and wait for her some more. Then they go in to make sure she's still there. Then they come out. And if they go in to make sure she's still there and she's not, that's when they start flying everywhere, looking for where she's bivouacked. So traditional orientation flights for queen honeybees that are virgins, I've not seen that, but also when you're about to have a swarm, that queen is pretty heavy, so they tend to land early. And uh, I just showed this video at Edinburgh University yesterday, 
as I videoed the queen coming out and doing everything I'm describing to you right now. And it's also sometimes why the queen might not make a very good flight when she first gets out. They might land again within 50 or 100 feet of the hive. And uh, that's then, of course, their bivouac spot. They all collect around the queen uh, based on her pheromone. And then uh, the scouts go out and they find a new place to live. But queen orientation flights for the established laying queen, extremely rare, and I've not seen it. So if you know of a study though that shows that, that would be really cool. The next part of it is, once you have a swarm in a box, can you immediately relocate them without worrying about the three foot, three mile rule? For me personally, yes, relocate them right away. And since a lot of people are doing swarm collection this time of year, and uh, if you're trying to start off with bees and you don't have a good source for your bees right now, get yourself on that swarm list. Get connected with a beekeeper that has experience that's on a swarm list because here's what I'm doing this year. I put myself on a swarm list because uh, I want to go out and get swarms for people. Uh, and by that I mean people that have already taken courses in beekeeping that just don't have their bees yet. Or maybe you know somebody that lost their bees over the winter time. Uh, I invite them to meet me at the location where the swarm is. They bring their equipment and then I just walk them through hiving the bees. And you can put them anywhere you want. So, But that's of course miles away from here when somebody calls in and says, Hey, we have a swarm. We don't know what to do. Get a beekeeper. So that's where I meet people and let them collect their own bees. Now, what if it's one of the colonies that I have under my control and it's one of my own swarms on a nearby tree? I don't want to get rid of those. I don't want to give them away. Those are my own bees and they're doing really good. So I want to keep them around. So yes, I hive them up over and over. Put them right back in the same apiary. First empty box I have this year. I have three empty hives that are waiting for swarms. They're going to need swarms this year. And uh, they'll go right in those. And uh, I have no problems with them staying there. Now once you've hived them up, you're going to see a bunch of scouts returning to the spot. As long as the queen's pheromone is still on the branch or something, you'll see bees collect there for a while. Guess where they'll go if they can't figure out where you took the swarm. They'll go back to the original colony, the original uh, hive, and uh, they'll be fine. So no problem. Don't worry about the three foot or three miles. For those of you who are wondering, what is he talking about three feet and three miles? Well, that's when you have an established colony and you're going to move the entire colony to a new location during a time of year when they're already foraging and everything else. So winter time is a great time to move them and reconfigure your apiary in any way you want. But now we're in spring, rapid increase. Uh, then you do follow the under three feet or the three mile rule. So if you wanted to really move them around, uh, you can move them in increments a foot a day and watch how disoriented they get even from that. They go to the spot, even though there's no hive there, here's where you move the hive from here to here. They go to the spot here and hover around like they have no idea what's going on. And you also want to change the configuration of your entrance of the hive, the landing board area. So if you've got your entrance reducer off to one side, flip it to the other side because it also encourages the bees that are coming out that morning and do this at night when you're moving hives around. Uh, they'll reorient. They'll do those orientation flights when something has happened to alter their entrance. So good questions and timely because people will be putting swarms in. And another thing I want to say about swarming is uh, if you have a swarm trap up and it's out there and it's successful and collects a swarm of bees, have a second swarm trap ready to go because as soon as you take it down, put another one right in its place because it happens so often that multiple uh, swarms will go to the exact same location right after you've taken the other one down. And you want to give them a place to get in shelter and so that you can come back and collect those too because those are freebies. Question number five comes from Jed from Mississippi. Could I get your thoughts on what just happened? A little long, but I don't want to leave anything out. On March 5th, I did a hive inspection on my biggest hive. Everything was fine, but it had a huge population. I went completely through the hive and decided to add another super with five frames of better comb and five acorn frames. So for those of you who don't know what that is, better comb is waxed pre-drawn comb that's synth it's synthesized to match the lipids that are used by the bees when they make their own comb, but it is a synthetic comb with drawn cells. And then there's acorn heavy waxed frames outside of that, so that's a plastic foundation. So I'm just starting my second year and have no extra drawn comb. I did another hive inspection March the 12th and found the bees were starting to build swarm cells. 
Some of the cells had larvae in them, so I split the hive. My two best frames I wanted to use in the split had larvae in the queen cells, so I crushed them and caught the queen and did the split. On my inspection, March the 20th, so we're here from the 12th to the 20th. I found capped queen cells, so everything is fine, which brings me to today. I wasn't getting going to check that hive because I knew if a queen had hatched, it would be a little while before she made it and started laying. I walked across the bee yard and everything was normal on the way back. The big hive I took the queen from is swarming. How? There is no way the queen has hatched and made it in a week's time. The only thing I can think of is the hive had more than one queen. What do you think? The hive I moved... The original queen, too, is doing fine. She's there. Good news. I caught the swarm. Okay, so that's exactly what happened. There was another queen there. So, now, how would you know that? When you take it apart and you get the queen out of there and you think, you know, they're building cells, so you know they're, they're going to supersede the queen, they're going to have a swarm, and you created a swarm by removing the existing queen, the existing queen and her resources, and they think, you got it set, we're good. Because, as described here, from egg to adult, emerging from that queen cell, is only 14 days. But then we need another 9 days to 14 days before that queen, after she emerges from the queen cell, before she can finish maturing and then be capable of flying and mating, and then beyond that to lay eggs. So now if we're finding eggs now are ready, the only answer is that there's another queen there. So she could have been a virgin, and uh, her... Uh, pheromone was not very strong. That's why they continue to work with the other cells that are there. And uh, in between that time, she probably flew, got mated, and started laying. So when you check back on your hive, the evidence that the queen is still there, or that a queen has been there within three days, is when you find eggs. So it sounds like everything, though, is good here. And the puzzle is that often we think we find the queen, we get her out of there. In fact, kind of that bad scenario would be, although it didn't happen here because, as described, the new colony where the queen was placed is doing great and everything's productive, so we know that was the mature laying queen. But sometimes two queens will exist in the same colony, and one of them, it's an interesting behavior, one of them will be suppressed by the other queen's pheromones. So in other words, you'll have a queen that's mated and mature, but not producing. And uh, it's an interesting thing that can happen. And again, it's through pheromones. So that queen's pheromones are not well represented in the colony because the queen that's in lay is the one getting all the attention from the retinue of nurse bees. They're constantly licking her. They're taking care of her. They're feeding her. They're nurturing her. And they're spreading her pheromones through all the rest of the colony. So if you've got another queen that's present but not actively laying, then she's not getting all that attention. Her pheromones are weak and she's still there. You took the other queen away. Now all of a sudden in the absence of the other queen's pheromone, theory, we're just talking, bee biology. So if this other queen was there, now all of a sudden, ha ha ha, gets all the attention of the remaining bees because the other queen's gone. They're in a panic. This one has pheromones. This is a queen. Now she can become productive again because queen bees have the ability to cut back on the eggs that they're producing and laying. And then, of course, increase the number of eggs that they're producing and laying because the sperm is stored in the queen's spermatheca, and that's where she's going to fertilize the eggs from that. So she could still be good to go. So I think you had a second queen. She was already there. And uh, if you had checked in a couple of days after that, you would know that she's around. And if you can find her, mark her. Speaking of marking your queens this year, and I hope everybody practices that and gets to do it, yellow is the color for this year. And this is that hard to find competitive advantage MPD TAC 15 marker. These are alcohol based. So they dry really fast. They work really well. Mark all your queens. I started doing that last year more so I could show other people how to do it. But it turned out to be a really worthwhile tool because marking all the queens really demonstrated that I have a high queen turnover rate, which I was not aware of. Because uh, in every inspection, there were always eggs, or there was always larvae at all stages, and all this stuff is going on. But then I would notice there goes the queen, and, and she's not marked. But yet, I marked the queen in this colony three weeks ago. So, interesting things are going on in these beehives. And marking your queens is a good idea. Another thing that I thought about 
last year that I plan to implement this year. So even though I said yellow's the the year, I mean, what does that mean to you? It helps you track through the years how old a queen is by the colors you mark. But if you're keeping your own records, you can use any color. So find out, get a piece of wood or something and get a bunch of different colors and try to make the piece of wood as close as it can to the color of honeybees. And then put different marks on that piece of wood and see which one stands out to your eye the best. They even have fluorescent colors, by the way. So if you're one of those people that has a hard time spotting the queen, even when they're marked, and you're not in some kind of breeding program where the color of the marking on the queen is critical to tell the age of the queen and everything else, you can have your own colors. You can have magenta or something. So if you put a bright color that really stands out to you on the thorax of your queen, then uh, it's going to help you spot them better. And then you keep your own logs and records about what age that queen was that got that color. So you don't have to adhere to the will you raise good bees color, you know, sequence. So anyway, yeah, second queen in there. Mark your queens. Question number six. This is from Jerry from Delhi, Delhi, Ontario, Canada. Darn, wish I knew these names better. I had a dead out and some of the capped honey had some mold on it. And if I harvest the honey via scrape and separate, will that be a health problem? And if so, what would you recommend I do with these frames? So a lot of people that are pulling apart beehives this spring, they've been through a winter, no matter where you are, uh, you can see, first of all, sometimes people get upset when they see a white chalky substance on it, or they'll see sometimes white powdery mildew on the surface of especially honeycomb that's off in the corners and things like that. And then sometimes you see black mold also because it's a byproduct of moisture and the resources that are there. Mold feeds on resources. Well, the white powdery stuff, first of all, the chalky substance is bloom that happens on honeycomb. Honey, wax, beeswax, sorry. So that's okay. That can go away. In fact, you can hit that with a hairdryer or something and it goes away if it's unsightly to you. Normally the bees, when they're alive and the population's good, they just continually groom and lick the surface of the comb so everything's okay. Now, I don't know of any evidence that the black mold that develops on the surface of some comb when it's been damp, uh, I don't know that that's um, dangerous to people for consumption. So if you're uncapping and then spinning out what's in those frames, I would say that that's okay unless somebody can find something to the contrary. Uh, so I think it's all usable for people. Some people even... Um, restore the colonies like if they catch a swarm or something like that and they let the bees clean that all up but you can certainly harvest it for yourself and use the honey and so what else about that is good and i actually because this question came up even uh, when you have a sugar syrup feeder so when you're starting out a colony whether it's a swarm or it's a package or you're kicking off a nucleus that you really want them to be strong so you put on sugar syrup and uh, one of the advantages of putting in an essential oil in your sugar syrup is that it extends it so that it doesn't uh, get that black mildew. But then, you know, it always takes one person who's brand new, usually, who just goes, well, what's wrong with the black mildews in there? What happens if there's black mold? What's the problem? So, I mean, we all make the assumption that, well, black mold or mildew, it's not fresh. We want the freshest for our bees that we can give them. And if there's black mold or mildew, we have to add, uh, you know, the bleach to the syrup to make sure and kill and sanitize that uh, drinker that we put on the hives. But then that led me wondering, left me wondering, is there anything wrong with it though? I mean, I don't know, maybe there isn't. What we don't want to happen with your sugar syrup is for it start to go off and, and start to ferment, which is what happens with high water content because we have kind of free flowing organisms that will impact it and cause it to ferment and it gets into your sugar syrup. So we want to avoid that. And that's where the essential oils come up. And I was talking to someone yesterday and the only essential oil that we're adding to hives, that uh, adding to the syrup that has been proven scientifically beneficial to the bees is the Hive Alive uh, Feed Enhancer for bees with seaweed, it's called. So this one is the only one with scientific supporting data. And the advantage is that it helps suppress nosema, which this time of year would be at its peak. 
So if you're starting off with sugar syrup and you're looking for an essential oil to add to it, that not only extends the sugar syrup and keeps the mold from developing because the jury's out. I don't know what's wrong with it, if at all, if anything. So if you know something, you find a study, please share the link. But by putting in essential oils, Honey Bee Healthy, Pro Health, Beekeeper's Pal, uh, those things will all serve to extend the syrup, keep it fresh, keep it from spoiling. But uh, Hive Alive will actually do that, plus suppress nosema. So that's that. So scrape it, use it, go ahead. I see no reason why you couldn't. So now we're in the fluff section already. I know, it happened really quick. And I just found out, uh, remember when I did my interview series, which by the way, I'm having a really good time getting to know these beekeepers and uh, documentary people and researchers. Uh, and we're doing interviews. So if you haven't seen those, you can go to thewaytobee.org and look at my interview page because whenever there's a new interview, goes right on there and you'll be able to see it. Have a very good one coming up tonight that you're going to want to see, especially you horizontal hive people. So little teaser there. But one thing uh, is when I was talking to Dr. David Peck, who is uh, head of research and also education at Better Be, got an email just before I came in here to do this today. And uh, we were talking about those queen cages. And I'm a little bit annoyed <clears throat> because... This is a queen isolation cage, and uh, I bought a bunch of these, and I got them from Blue Sky Bee Supply, and then guess what they did? They sold out, so I was like, yeah, I got them, and everybody else wants them. I mean, I'm not trying to keep other people from getting them, but if they were going to run out, I'm glad I got mine first. But anyway, you put your frame in here, and you can isolate. Of course, it has to be drawn comb. You don't put a queen in here, but it's a queen excluder, so worker bees can get in and out. They can attend to the queen. She just can't get out to the rest of the hive, so we can force a brood break in your hive. And in the meantime, because she has access to both sides of this frame, we're talking about over 7,000 eggs she could be laying while she's in this cage. But look at this. See, this is a half queen cage, right? So it has to go up against the side of your deep brood box. And that's good. That's fine for me because I figured I would run her up against the eastern side because that's where they tend to, in the springtime in particular, build a lot of brood right there. And this is part of a, for those who don't want to treat their bees, for those who want to create an artificial brood break and then uh, get rid of that brood. So some people, the frame that they put in here would be that green frame, the foundation with drawing comb again, don't try to use it to start drawing comb. Uh, they'll use the green drone foundation and that acts as a magnet and draws in all of the um, Varroa destructor mites in there. And then when it gets capped, we've got a long time because remember the drones are the longest to produce. So from egg to adult, hatched out, you're talking 24 days. So then you get on the 20th, 21st day, you pull that frame out and then you release the queen and she goes back to laying throughout the rest of the colony, but you've sucked up a bunch of drones then or varroa destructor mites into your drone capped pupae and you remove them so here's the thing and i thought when dr peck said they're going to carry that at better bees so don't worry about it blah 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 it's going to be available i thought he was talking about the same thing no he's talking about a queen cage but it's a better one yeah, the queen cage that they're selling and by the way it's a pre-order because they're not actually going to be delivering them. So you're, you're back ordering them right now. So if you want to be the first one in there, June 1st is when they're going to start shipping, which is actually a good time to be doing IPM anyway, for those of you who want to go treatment free and just manage the bees and manage Varroa out of your hives. But theirs is a complete cage, goes around it on all sides, which means that you can still keep that frame in the middle where the brood would normally be in the middle of your cluster frames, you know, fourth position, fifth position, whatever. And theirs are better. And they're not super expensive, by the way. And these were very expensive. And I don't know if Blue Sky is going to start making them, but I will say this. If I were looking for a queen cage now, confinement for the queen, uh, so that I could do that IPM, uh, I would be getting the ones from Better Be over the ones I currently have. But since I have Four of these I will be using mine because they're here and I already own them. But I prefer those. June 1st, I'll put a link down in the video description. 
upcoming interviews. So there's a trend here. We're going to be talking to people that uh, don't treat their bees, that have holistic beekeeping. So if you haven't seen the interview that I had with uh, Daniel Weaver out of uh, Texas, I highly advise that you look at that. If you want to know a little bit more about how they arrived at Treatment Free, the philosophy behind it, is it going to work? I just had an interview with Michael Palmer up in Vermont. Everyone agrees uh, the future of beekeeping, the sustainable future of beekeeping is genetics and integrated pest management, hopefully at some point free of treatments. So somebody else is probably sitting there listening going, Fred, aren't you going to treat with oxalic acid or something? I am. I still am. I'm not a breeder. So if I have mite counts that are really high, uh, then uh, I'm going to hit them with that. I mean, if I use that and get the numbers down, and then I've got a bunch of phoretic mites on the bees or in the rest of the colony. By the way, Better Bee has an excellent schedule system. If you're isolating your queen for this purpose, go to the page, look at it, print the sheet, and now you have your procedure, regardless of what you use to segregate your queen from the rest of the colony to create this break so you can do a treatment. Because we know if we have a brood break, uh, oxalic acid vaporization, a single treatment is going to be over 90% effective in killing off ferrodestructor mites. So I would much rather do that and get a single treatment out and then restore the queen and put her back into full production as quick as possible and uh, see how that goes. April 1st, of course, is today. If you know of any pranks other than the weather, share how you've been pranked or how you prank somebody else. Something harmless, something fun, something clever. By the way, rubber band on the vegetable sprayer at the kitchen sink uh, doesn't work unless those rubber bands were the exact same color of the sprayer itself. So nice try there. And uh, just what are your what are your pranks? This is the fluff section, by the way. We're talking about anything we want. The other thing is keep feed on spring. Maximum starvation period right now. Losses are heavy. The state of Pennsylvania, based on the losses that are reported right now, more than 40% losses of beehives. So for my apiary, uh, we had 20, we lost three. So I think I'm doing okay. Especially since when I went into fall and collected a lot of single deep uh, swarm captures and things that weren't really going to make it. My colony number seven that was raided so heavily by the wasps in the fall, they were already being wiped out. They did not make it. Horizontal hive, my long Langstroth, did not make it. Somebody else wrote recently and said, hey Fred, give us an update on that long Langstroth hive because I want to know if it's going to work uh, based on your experiences. Well, please don't base it on my experiences because that's also the colony that had all the brood problems in it. So they had brood disease. So I can't say that my horizontal long Langstroth hive was a failure by configuration because the colony bees that were in there actually had the problems with brood. And uh, what else? So, and one of my nucleus colonies did not make it. Nucleus hives. I'm going to be continuing with those. If you don't have them already, the five frame boxes, wooden boxes. I highly recommend not buying the little flimsy plastic ones and things like that. The wooden ones are going to last a really long time. So get those great resources. We talked about that with Mike Palmer too. He credits having uh, a good bank of uh, nucleus hives, nucleus colonies that are ready. He just keeps stacking them as I did. I did five over fives. Mike Palmer did four over four over four. So he did three high deeps in uh, nucleus colonies, but they're four frames each. So this height, this narrow configuration that goes high, turns out to be a very good configuration, even in very cold climates, like the northwest part of Vermont and me here in the snow belt in Pennsylvania. So be ready for expansion, have your boxes, have everything cleaned up and ready to go. I know a lot of people have been putting that off. And I did get a question about uh, eco wood. Is there any update? How's it going? How's it working? So for those of you who don't know, uh, often when you get new equipment, you have to think about what you're going to finish it with so that it can last a good long time. And uh, it also depends on the material that you're working with here. So here's the material that I have. I have cedar, which you can leave untreated altogether if you want to. Uh, I have hoop pine, which comes out of Australia. And I have regular pine that comes from Man Lake, but I stopped buying woodenware for Man Lake. If you look at uh, 
some other beekeepers online. They have not been very happy with the stock that they got from Man Lake. I'm among those who got some wood that was incomplete, marked funny, didn't fit well. It was really weird. Um, and so I also bought my woodenware from Better Bee. And so uh, once you get it, you have to finish it. So it's pine. And you can finish it with an extra latex semi-gloss paint, I recommend, if you want to. But then uh, I learned about Eco Wood, which uh, is a non-toxic wood finish that you actually dip your boxes in. So I like the idea of that. I could mix up the five-gallon pack, and then um, it goes on like water, which seems like it wouldn't work. But it really does preserve the wood. Now, there were examples of uh, where it wasn't doing a very good do job of keeping the wood from cupping or bowing or warping a little bit. So although the Eco Wood treatment, which is a mineral treatment for your wood and safe for the bees once it's cured and set and everything. Um, so it keeps it from rotting. I didn't see mold or anything on it. And in some places, water even beaded on it. So I, I was, that was promising. But it did not keep the wood from cupping or shifting, especially where you had the little thin pieces at the top of your boxes in the front where the box joints come together. So it didn't necessarily stabilize the wood very well. And a flat wooden surface like migratory covers, they still split and cupped and uh, deformed a little bit with eco wood treatment on them. So then when I continue to work with eco wood, yeah, I will, because then now we've learned I want to make sure all my joints are glued really well. Currently, I use for wood glue Tight Bond 2. I know there's also a Tight Bond 3, which is supposed to be superior but and has a longer working time, but Tight Bond 2 is lasting fantastic. It's been around a long time. It's a great wood for all wood glue for all your joints. So I glue everything up with Tight Bond 2, then Eco Wood Dip. Now, that said, if I had infinite resources, right? This is gonna lead me to my shout out for today, which by the way, last week I didn't do a very good shout out. I don't think I did one at all. But the shout out today is gonna to be topic specific. So it's gonna be about dipping your boxes and uh, what they look like after they've been dipped. So how do they hold up? How's it looking now? And do you have to get a big expensive system to do a paraffin wax dip and it's a paraffin blend and there's all this other stuff going on. That's the, beyond the scope of my ability here uh, where I live. I don't have enough hives to justify that. I'm not going to take a chicken scalder and convert it over to a paraffin wax dip for my wooden hives, but I think you might know. There's a guy that uh, a couple of you might know. His name is Cayman Reynolds, and he's my shout out today, Tennessee's Bees, because he's done a series of videos on wax dipping your hives. So if I had those resources, if I had a place to do it, if I had the extra money and all these great things, I would say wax dipping, paraffin dipping, and these blends would be the superior finish for preserving the wood and for honeybee acceptance. So I'm gonna leave a link down in the video description to Cayman Reynolds, and just as we do with all the shout outs, please go there and tell him Frederick Dunn sent us. If you would just say hey to Kevin Cayman for me and uh, I've done it on as I said a bunch of different wood samples I love the way eco wood looks it's a natural look it's gonna hold up nothing's gonna rot so that's the good news uh, but you have to stabilize the wood so I'm thinking that's all I have I kind of have to wrap up early today because I'm doing an interview this evening with somebody that's widely known in horizontal beekeeping and I hope you'll look for the release of that interview later on this weekend. I'm also interviewing uh, some other very interesting people in some very unorthodox uh, interactions with honeybees. So I'm glad that you spent some time with me here today. I hope that you're going to have a fantastic first day of April, better than us here in the snow. And I hope that your weekend is really good and that you're ready for your bees to really take off. Thanks for watching, have a great weekend.
Thank you.